Welcome everyone. Um, I am thrilled to go ahead and, and start. Um, so welcome everyone. This is our, uh, to the seminar on retrospective contact tracing, uh, co-hosted by the Berkman Klein Center on the Internet and Society, Harvard Medical School's Program and Global Public Policy, the National Governors Association and Partners in Health. I'm Dr. Margaret Bordeaux. I'm the research director of the program in global public policy at Harvard Medical School. And I co-chair the Berkman Klein Center Digital Pandemic Response. I am thrilled to welcome all of you to our first seminar and what I hope will be a series that focuses on practitioners and implementers of the COVID response. Um, I'd like to welcome with uh, today, Dr. Uh, Hitoshi Oshitani, who's a member of Japan's novel coronavirus disease control subcommittee, whose pioneering work has helped to develop the retrospective tracing methodology. He will present today on this methodology, how it was developed and how it is being implemented in, in Japan. I think that um, before I turn it over to him, I should note uh, that we are, really uh, happy to have him here because as I think many listeners know, we are in a very difficult position uh, here in the United States when it comes to the COVID epidemic. Um, we yesterday had more cases reported uh, in the country, uh, 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 I think overall, if not uh, at least since its first peak uh, in, in April. And we are at a moment where we really need to think about um, what we're going to do over the next couple of months. So I've always maintained, and I know, and I know Berkman Klein uh, Center and Harvard Medical School has always maintained that we are not helpless uh, before uh, this, uh, this epidemic, that there are things that we can do uh, and public health strategies that we can develop and uh, implement um, and uh, that will leave us in a much, much better place um, and so many of you have heard me talk about sort of the three-legged stool approach to the public health response um, with one leg being these environmental modifications that we can make, uh, ventilation, air filtration in our buildings to make transmission less uh, likely. Uh, the, public, uh, the other leg being the public health uh, population-based strategies of asking people to adopt behaviors that will protect them, like mask wearing or wearing PPE in appropriate contexts. Um, and then the third leg of contact tracing, which is where you try to interrupt uh, uh, individual chains of transmission uh, to decrease um, forward transmission. But the thing we haven't talked about so much is the seat of that stool, of that three-legged stool, which is really health intelligence and how you understand uh, the epidemic, where it is spreading, how it is spreading, so that you can refine uh, each of those three legs of the stool. Um, and in some sense, uh, retrospective contact tracing is one approach uh, to helping build more robust health um, intelligence in the, during the epidemic, um, and not only helping you with uh, your basic contact tracing approach as well. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Oshitani. Thank you, Margaret, for kind introduction. It's my great pleasure to be at this seminar to share our experience in Japan. I'm going to share the my slide. I hope you can see the my slide. So I'm going to talk uh, about uh, the the cluster-based approach the, in Japan, the, with uh, the focusing on uh, uh, retrospective contact tracing. So the these are the early findings of COVID-19 in Japan. The among close contact, the we had a very low the positive rate, the 1.3 percent in early cases, the early the, the close contact, and the similar finding the were obtained in uh, the China, and also the 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 chain of transmission patterns the were analyzed in the the very early the cluster the in february in japan the which showed that the 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 one 
the individual infected many others and uh, the many other infected individual did not pass the virus to anybody else. That, that was, these are the early findings. And um, also the Dr. Nishiura, Hiroshi Nishiura, the, had the, some preliminary data the, which suggested that uh, the majority of infected individual the, the did not pass the virus to anybody else. And a small proportion of uh, the infected, the, the person, the, the infected many others. And this over dispersion characteristics of COVID-19 was also the, the shown in uh, other countries, the other places like Hong Kong. And um, so that was a basis of uh, our cluster-based approach. And uh, if there is no, the, the, the cluster or super spreading event, the, the no, there is no sustained outbreak. But uh, the only when the, the chain of cluster is established, that's the time, that's the, the situation where the, we can, we have sustained outbreak of COVID-19. And the, the prospect of contact tracing are the, the, the done like this. And if you define confirmed cases, that you identify the contacts. And among contacts, the, the, you are trying to identify the, the cases, COVID-19 positive cases. But as I mentioned, the positive rate is quite low and uh, probably the one of the two contact that may be uh, identified by the prospect contact tracing, but uh, the no the cluster that can be found the, by identifying the ten or so the, the confirmed cases. You need to find many more the confirmed cases to identify the clusters, and. Um, the also the another the tricky part of this virus, the COVID-19, is uh, the invisible nature of this virus. The for SARS, the majority of infected individuals develop the very severe the pneumonia, viral pneumonia. That's why we could identify the almost all chains of transmissions, and we managed to interrupt the all chains of transmission. And, uh, but for COVID-19, there are many mild cases or even asymptomatic cases. And the, which the, makes this virus the more difficult to identify. And uh, this invisible nature is uh, another challenge for COVID-19. And also there is a significant difference uh, the, between COVID-19 and the SARS in terms of infectivity for SARS only the, 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 when the patient develop very severe symptom, that's when the, they had infectivity. But for COVID-19, the peak of infectivity is believed to be the, before the onset of the illness. So this also makes this virus more difficult to control. And the, the in retrospective contact tracing, if when we find the one confirmed cases, the, we try to identify the source of infection. The, as I mentioned, the, if there is no cluster or super spreading event, the, there is no sustained the, the chain of transmission. So there must be the cluster somewhere the, around the, the each case. So we try to identify the source of infection. The, which some the, in many cases the which is a cluster or the, the associated with cluster. So this is a retrospective contact tracing. So in Japan, the, we are also doing a prospect contact tracing, but the, we are more focusing on retrospective contact tracing, which identify the common source of infection. The, and uh, the contact tracing in Japan the, is 
mainly done by the public health nurses. There are the over the 460 public health centers all over Japan. And uh, there are more than 28,000 uh, officers stationed in the pu these public health centers, including the more than 8,000 public health nurses. And uh, these public health nurses are mainly in charge of the contact tracing. And the retrospective contact tracing has been done the, as their routine work for investigation of uh, the, the particularly the tuberculosis cases. As you, you probably know, we are still having uh, many uh, TB cases in Japan. For TB, the identifying the source of infection is very important. So that's why they are used to the, these, the retrospective contact tracing. And actually, the, from the beginning, they've been, the public health nurses, they have been doing the, these uh, retrospective contact tracing. The, and um, the, so this is a, the diagram for the, our contact tracing. The, in addition to the, the, to identify the secondary cases from the, the confirmed cases, the, we try to the identify the source of infection by asking their activities in past 14 days. And uh, probably 14 days is uh, too long. And in most of the cases, uh, we identify the source the, within the, the five or seven days the, before the onset. But in some cases, the, the, the we identify the source the nine or 11 days before the onset. And, um, but for many cases, the, we identified the source, the, the three to five days the, before the onset. And then by the doing this approach, the 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 one the objective of this approach the, is to interrupt the chain of chain of clusters, and uh, it is the usually the the when we identify the the super spreading event, the the the, the there are some the secondary transmission the, from the cluster. But uh, the, we still can the, interrupt the chain of transmission the, uh, from the cluster. And we also the, try to identify common characteristics of clusters. The, we have identified the many clusters in Japan. And uh, so these are the most important common characteristics of, of the clusters, the, the closed space, uh, crowded places and the close contact settings. And uh, so these are now known as the Sanmitsu in Japanese and the Wasiris in English. And the, even the, the primary school kids the, know about this concept. And the public was asked to avoid the, these, the risky the environment the, to reduce the number of the, the clusters. And the further analysis of clusters identify the, some additional the risk factors, such as uh, the exercises, talking in loud voice, the singing, and also the nightlife settings. And um, also, the, 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 we identify the, who, were likely, who are likely to transmit the virus to the others. So these are the, the co characteristics of uh, the primary cases of the cluster. The primary cases that tend to be young, the, in 20s and 30s. And the, although the, the, the average, the age of uh, the, the other case, uh, total cases, the, the were much the older. So they are probably the, the the more infectious the, because they are more active, and um, the majority of primary cases had more than forty percent of the primary cases there were the pre-symptomatic phases. 
And uh, the, we are analyzing the more cases in Japan. Uh, and uh, over the 17,000 cases have been they analyzed. And uh, the, the pattern is still exactly the same. The, the more than the three quarter of the cases the, did not pass the virus to anybody else. And, but the, the small proportion of uh, the infected the individual that infected many others, the, the, the sometimes more than 10 people. And um, so the secondary cases the, the is generated the, by the relatively the older people and the, the from the children, the, the percent of uh, the, the cases that generating the secondary transmission was the quite low. And this is the epidemic curve of Japan as of uh, November 10. And uh, we had uh, the first outbreak, the first wave of outbreak uh, uh, from the February to May. And the second one started the, at the beginning of uh, the June. And this, this wave is still continuing. And uh, now we are seeing this, some increasing trend. And uh, so we, uh, analyzing the clusters and uh, many clusters have been analyzed and uh, the the setting where the clusters are occurring there is changing and um, so it is important to the monitor the the clusters and uh, so that we can implement the specific measures for the specific setting and uh, especially in June and July the we had the many the clusters in the large nightlife entertainment district in the major cities, especially in Tokyo, and from there the, we had many uh, community transmission, including household, schools, restaurant parties, and uh, then the, at the end the the, the virus the reached to the, the the nursing homes and the hospitals and uh, where the majority of severe cases occurred. So and, uh, it's important to, trans to interrupt the transmission somewhere the, before the virus reached to the hospital and the nursing homes. And, uh, and, and these are the transmission patterns in the community. And uh, if there is a medium to large size clusters, the, we may see the, some household, trans uh, household the clusters and uh, the clusters in the workplaces and the, the eventually in the hospital. But uh, if there is only small cluster, uh, there might be some the household cluster, but uh, the, there's no further the transmission. And uh, many of uh, the transmission chain is interrupted the, in the community. So now we are discussing the, the prioritization of cluster investigations, including the retrospective contact tracing. Then the, because the partly because uh, the, we are seeing the increasing trend of the cases and uh, the public health nurses and the public health centers are overwhelmed now. And uh, the, in such settings, the high priority the, should be given to the hospital and the long-term care facilities, including the nursing homes. And the nightlife entertainment the, is also the, the, the risky, uh, setting uh, because uh, the, from these settings, uh, the community transmission, they can be the, the starting. And also the large social gathering like the parties and the theater, live music event and so on. And, but the, the schools, university colleges and the workplaces, the, these are the, the, the setting the where the, the, the from where the, the, the community transmission is less likely to occur. The, the, unlike uh, in US, we haven't seen the, the very large clusters in universities. And uh, so the, for further information, we the, set up the, our website and uh, you can see the, the, some of the information uh, the, about our approach, including uh, the, the, the English, the, the guidance for the, 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 the 
epidemiological investigation, including the, the retrospect contact tracing. And uh, so this site was actually the, the established by our colleagues, uh, the, including uh, Dr. Jindai and uh, the Mieko Kikuchi. And um, so I appreciate, appreciate uh, their effort to set up this uh, the website. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for going uh, through that with us. I, you know, I think we can all start to see how, um, you know, how this approach can really change how we think about, you know, super spreading events being not, not necessarily about an individual, but where that individual goes uh, and, and how they're relating to others and in which environments. Um, I want to so just to say, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sung, um, and then afterwards I see some questions coming in. Uh, we'll have plenty of time uh, for, for questions after um, Dr. Sung's remarks, uh, so keep them coming. Um, so to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. KJ Sung is a, a total honor. Um, he is the Chief of Strategy and Policy at uh, Partners in Health in uh, Massachusetts COVID-19 Response. He's also an associate physician at the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital and assistant professor at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, and he's going to focus on sort of, okay, yes, this is a cool, amazing technique, uh, but how, how do you do it? How do you, how do you execute on it? So KJ, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think for a lot of you, it's the first time you've heard uh, Professor Oshitani. Um, for us, it was actually, I think it was back in July when we heard, um, you know, Professor Oshitani was very gracious to get on a quick Zoom call with our project. And um, it, was, uh, it was really a different way of doing things. And so we want to explain exactly how we restructured our project to, in, to uh, incorporate a lot of these techniques. Um, and just a little background on our project here in Massachusetts. Uh, this is a state, um, 7 million people. Uh, the project, this is uh, the Community Tracing Collaborative. Uh, and you can see up there on the left, there are, there are 351 local boards of health in, in the state, uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So each one of those uh, has jurisdiction over its town, has its own public health department. The, um, and so the collaborative is really, uh, is really uh, meant to uh, incorporate all of these. So it's really the, the, those local health departments that are doing uh, a lot of the contact tracing. Um, and there is another surge workforce uh, of contact tracers that is meant to backstop those uh, in case those, um, uh, those public health nurses really who are very closely aligned uh, with um, what's happening in the field, uh, start to get um, overly uh, uh, high caseloads. And so um, a lot of these uh, concepts and strategies we have incorporated into this surge workforce, um, which tends to, you know, which can really float across the state and is not um, restricted uh, to work in any uh, one jurisdiction. So it's really set up as a large call center and a lot of other states uh, ha have done this as well. And it's a unified force, it's, a, it's got a single database. Um, there might be a few things in Massachusetts that are different from other states. Uh, for us, the CTC um, contact tracing units have, uh, have case investigators and contact tracers. The case investigators do the initial case investigation. Uh, the contact tracers are then making calls to uh, close contacts. In reality, those two roles are very, very similar. And in fact, those, uh, those people uh, really do both things uh, depending on the need. We also have a third cadre called the care resource coordinators. And we know that uh, people need support. They need nutritional support. They need medicines. They need transportation. They need all of these things to stay in isolation and quarantine. So, so there's a third cadre, a smaller cadre that is also floating uh, throughout the, uh, the contact tracing units. Uh, and um, for those uh, cases and contacts that are flagged, um, the, the CRCs will, will be able to provide that support. So the first problem, 
you know, I think as you t listen to D Dr. Oshitani and uh, you probably had the same reaction that I did, which was that uh, what he is really explaining with respect to retrospective contact tracing is different. It is not actually what we are doing. It is not part of WHO protocols or CDC protocols. Uh, there is, you know, our, our protocols are meant to do perspective contact tracing. And that means uh, uh, from 48 hours prior to symptom onset, that is anybody, uh, you're really looking for the people who that case could have infected. It's the, but to go back retrospectively, in, you know, there, in all of these protocols, there is some, um, there is some data collection about, about possible exposures. But really, I think if you listen to, to the professor, you can, you, can, you can see that it's actually much more involved. And so um, what we have done is, if you really think about it as level one and level two, uh, instead, of, um, in, uh, instead of really pushing out that level two, which is a retrospective component into the entire contact tracing workforce of over a thousand, a thousand people, we chose to, to develop a smaller unit. Uh, so really a unit within the overall uh, contact tracing team. Um, and we called it the Epidemic Intelligence Unit, the EIU. And it's really less than 20 people at this point. But um, you can see here though, that, that if you're gonna take this approach, uh, the, the larger contact tracing workforce, so level one clearly has to involve some aspects of level two. So in, in some sense, level one is the first, um, the first contact, the first communication with the case, that initial first call. And so if uh, the person, the, con the case investigator is not really sensitized, is not really thinking about uh, where the case was, um, was infected, then that hint or that tip about a possible cluster at a workplace at, uh, at a restaurant, at a yoga studio uh, or a hockey team, uh, that cannot be given to the EIUs and level two can't start. So level one definitely here, I think it's, it's you know, I think it shows the different roles and the differences between the level one and the level two, but um, really that level one, you know, even if you do have an EIU, a smaller unit, that can really handle the retrospective component, you can't completely, you know, there's still a lot of training that has to be done to your larger content tracing workforce. So really over, in our case, it's, it's over a thousand people. So that's one issue here is that, is that how do you expand your protocols and, uh, and how do you expand your, your workflows to get around the first problem, which is that it's not really what Professor Oshitani is describing is not contained in current um, uh, contact tracing protocols for COVID. So the other problem is, is this one, which is that um, the, you know, the, the cluster, and I think that uh, in the previous presentation, there was some discussion of this, is that clusters are not obvious. They are, the cluster analysis and the investigation is, is fragmented. Um, and so you, you, you really, you know, um, I know that uh, Professor Oshitani has talked a lot about the danger of the isolated case. So when you're seeing a lot of isolated cases, so cases you say, you know, uh, I don't know where I got infected. I have no, I don't, I don't know. I, I know who I could have infected because I'm living maybe with my household. I don't know where I got infected. That's an isolated case. It's not connected to a cluster. That's dangerous. Um, it, and you know the other thing I, what I would expand on that is that it's really the isolated household, right? So we know the easiest part of this is 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 the household transmission. I'm not saying that it's easy to prevent, but it's certainly easy to to find. Everybody is living with with people. Their close contacts are they're, they're at high risk for infection. So you what you see um, is isolated households. You have high households. There are household clusters that are all over the place, but they don't seem to be connected to any, uh, any cluster. 
So when you start to do this retrospective analysis, what you find is that, you know, each household and, you know, in Massachusetts is that we consolidate those household case, uh, contacts and those cases into one contact tracer. So really um, those follow-up calls can be made in a much more efficient manner. But, you know, as your retrospective contact tracing continues, you, know, you may find that this household is actually connected to a larger cluster. So suppose actually three households uh, um, act, um, went to a play date for uh, for um, at one of the, one of the uh, at one of the ad addresses. So now you know now these aren't actually isolated households. This is a small cluster. But the way that um, you have set up your contact tracing, or the way that we set up our contact tracing program, is that there is one contact tracer. So there are actually three contact tracers who are following this relatively small cluster because there are three households that are involved. If you continue to do your ret retrospective contact tracing, and hypothetically, you find actually this is part of a larger, um, not a gigantic cluster, but still a larger cluster because one of the children went to a pool party where there were some teenagers involved who had actually gone to uh, a Halloween party. Well, again, this is, a, this is really uh, not a gigantic cluster, but you can see here that there are seven different contact tracers involved because there are seven different households. So it's very difficult, in fact, to see for each of these contact tracers, uh, they may, um, part of the training in that phase, in that uh, phase one is to at least get a hint, uh, is to really ask further than the 48 hours so they get an idea of how, um, where the exposure happened, whether there are play, those are play dates or Halloween parties, but really it's, it's impossible for, for all of them. And it's not, it's not efficient for them to try to figure out the extent of this cluster and, and to tr trace back um, even for this relatively small size, size cluster to, uh, to, the, to the Halloween party. So, the EIU really has to be, uh, it's really a problem of communication. So you have fragmentation because the, you know, people aren't getting tested. You cannot test 100% of the people in the community uh, every day. You may only pick up certain cases in the cluster, but then those cases are followed uh, by different people. And um, you really have to have a central, uh, a central unit. And we, for us, that's the EIU. And there has to be just free communication with the entire contact tracing workforce. So, you know, this cannot be done with a database. You know, there's no way to do this. Um, there's, there's no way to do this uh, from, from, from the outside. The, the EIU uh, has to be able to communicate um, with the people who are directly interviewing the cases and contacts, because what you find and you know, this is one of my pet peeves, is that when people are talking about why contact tracing is not being effective and why people are not listening or people are not, are not, are not complying with contact tracing, what I usually say and I tell them is that it's because in fact, you're not, you're not listening to what they are saying. And in fact, in our experience, uh, for example, retrospective contact tracing, uh, cases are extremely interested in how they got infected. They want to talk about it for hours. They, uh, and, and what we've in fact trained our contact tracers to do is to ignore that information that, um, that the cases want to tell them. So it's really a systems failure rather than an individual failure, a failure of, of, uh, of the community to comply, quote unquote, with contact tracing. Uh, so, just the last slide here, you know, because there's this other question that's, and that's the third problem is that is really what one of my colleagues calls the so what problem. What are you going to do with this information? So we have here a case, we have a case investigator, we have, um, you know, the, the, the follow up, the support, uh, there is uh, resource coordination. So this case can stay in isolation. But Actually, this case, let's say, is connected to a cluster. This is not an isolated case. This is perhaps it's a yoga instructor that was, uh, it was a yoga retreat that was held at a, uh, a weekend retreat that was held at a hotel, or it's a, it's a hockey team with a coach. 
uh, that's part of a league or it's a business, a large, uh, uh, it's a large uh, uh, meat processing plant with a manager and multiple shifts. So there is um, a larger social background um, uh, um, behind uh, this cluster that this case is in. You know, the, the case investigator, uh, you know, that's phase one, can get a, can get a tip uh, and can provide a tip to the EIU, but it's really the EIU that's responsible for looking at and really delineating uh, um, the, the, the boundaries, uh, the size of, of, of where this, um, this cluster took place, this particular cluster took place. There, um, we have a lot of tools for that, um, you know, that I've shown in previous slides, for example, those cluster maps. But the, in the end, you know, the question is really, is, is the so what? So how does this actually uh, prevent uh, um, future clusters? And that's really with, you know, in our case, with our local health departments, right? So that they have really jurisdiction, they have responsibility, uh, they can, uh, those public health nurses are able to, to talk to uh, coaches, to talk to leagues, to talk to hotels, to talk to businesses, and to have very much more in-depth discussions about how they're trying to defend uh, against COVID to prevent outbreaks in their, in their settings. And can even, um, you know, as a blunt instrument, uh, implement um, more uh, other sorts of um, of, uh, of restrictions on, on hours or operations that will cross out, you know, that will en encompass an entire sector. So the EIU here is, you know, the idea is that it, it, it's supposed to provide actionable intelligence. So you're, you're, you're collecting information from all of these case investigators, these thousands of contact tracers. You're trying to put them into a, um, a, a format that's useful, not not a bunch of, of names and numbers and dates, but to put them into a cluster map. Um, and we've developed some of those tools that I showed you previously, but those um, can be taken by local health departments, can be used to understand you know, very specific small or large clusters, can be used to discuss with business owners, with uh, places of worship, uh, with, with restaurant owners, um, and even you know, with, uh, with, with mayors, with um, uh, with city councils, can can be used to uh, to um, change policy uh, surrounding uh, COVID in in those jurisdictions. Um, thank you very much. Um, if you know the U.S. PIH's public health accompaniment unit is available to to help states, uh, and um, you know I hope that we'll be able to to talk more in the future. Fantastic. Um, right. So a lot of a lot of learning uh, has, has happened uh, here at the contact chasing program in Massachusetts. And um, thanks to Dr. Ishitani for for coaching us us through it. Um, I want to quickly give uh, the first the right of first question to uh, Dr. Tefeki, who uh, is a techno sociologist uh, who has written um, about uh, specifically uh, retrospective uh, contact tracing and the nature of, of COVID as something that spreads in these clusters. Um, and so I know that ever since your article in the Atlantic, you've also been uh, getting lots of questions. Um, Dr. Tefeki, about um, uh, about this. So I'll turn first to you, and then we'll go to our, our Q and A uh, in the uh, uh, Q and A panel. Thank you. Uh, I do want to start by um, thanking, especially Dr. Oshitani, both for the presentation and how willing he has been throughout the process to share. Uh, from Japan, all these important key points. And as you've noted, I have written uh, about some aspects of the pandemic, including uh, potential for airborne transmission and its relationship to clusters and this uh, backward cluster tracing that um, uh, from, uh, as we learned from Dr. Oshitani's example. So the first question I have is um, uh, what, percent of the cases you're finding are coming from this uh, retrospective cluster busting or are, or are you not doing like the traditional uh, prospective uh, tracing? Because as um, we heard from um, 
from the United States, that is not at all in our protocol. We just sort of mostly in most places do forward tracing. And one question I got a lot since writing this has been, well, if we do do this backward tracing, what do we expect? Do we have some numbers, some, uh, I mean, the theory is easy to explain and a lot of people are convinced, but it's kind of hard to get the practical side moving. And so people would like to hear what's the payoff? Do you have some percentages? Do you know like how, what percent of your cases are found you know, maybe first backward, then forward, or um, if you could enlighten us a little bit more, that would be very interesting, I think, to many states that are considering these protocols. Okay, can I answer this question? Please. Yeah. The, um, the, I don't have exact numbers, but uh, the, it also depends on the situation. But uh, when we define the cluster by doing the retrospective contact tracing, uh, we usually uh, can find the, the number of cases. The, sometimes the cluster is more than 50 or even more than 100. So the, by identifying the many clusters, uh, we can find more cases, and um, the, the I don't have an exact number, but uh, the probably the nearly half of our cases were found the, by identifying the clusters, and uh, also the, the we also the identify many unlinked cases, the the cases with uh, without any epidemiological links. And uh, but uh, the many of these cases are the many of these isolated cases. The probably the the do not generate any the secondary cases or the very few secondary cases. The, it's more important to identify the cluster than identifying the the many isolated cases. And uh, that's our concept. And that's why the, we are uh, putting more effort to identifying, to identify the, the clusters. Fantastic. KJ, do you want to um, follow up on that? How, and maybe you can include a little bit of, so, okay, so you think that uh, the cluster was at a yoga class or at a Halloween party, then, then what do you do? Do you go and, and test everybody that was at the Halloween party or at the, at the yoga class or how, how does that practically work? Yeah, I think that we're really getting to that, that question, which is, which is the so what? So what are you gonna do? What will you do with this information? And it really depends on the type of cluster. So I think that um, what we're seeing now in Massachusetts anyway, are we're not seeing, well, I can't really say that we're not seeing any very large clusters. Certainly we do see some of them, but what, we're, what we see more of are lots of little clusters and whether this is happening in the, in, in the workplace, uh, which is relatively controlled or at schools or, or, um, or social gatherings, which, you know, I don't think we're having the same sorts of large social gatherings that we did in the spring uh, when we were really taken aware. But um, these are these are harder to do, and I think that certainly in certain cases um, you can um, uh, you can you can increase you can target your testing. So if you have an idea that there's an outbreak at a church or a workplace, it's quite common, in fact, for business owners to say. Well, now I'm going to test the entire. I'm I'm going to test the entire workforce. So that you know, at that point, you're not trying to characterize the cluster. You're actually trying to stop transmission there. Social clusters, you know, this is the very very difficult. These are not huge um, gatherings. These are gatherings of 15 people, maybe four households, uh, maybe six people. Um, but with attack rates of 60, 70 percent, you know, pretty much everybody with it at an indoor gathering or at an indoor dinner party getting infected. Um, and um, there, you know, it's really about it can it can certainly inform your your community education. But 
Um, also just community advisories and restrictions of, of the size of social gatherings. It can inform those, those things as well. So I don't think that it is, uh, I think really for every type of cluster there is, there are certain um, uh, actions that can be taken on, on, a, on a local level. And I, you know, I would also agree with the professor that, that it is a clustering disease. So when you find these, if, if you know, we certainly are not able to find um, uh, hundred percent of the clusters. We may not be able to connect 100% or even 80% of all cases to clusters, but I don't think that's necessary. Um, you know, uh, this is, if you have characterized well, um, and, and certainly when you're having a huge caseload, it's really impractical. You cannot, you cannot uh, do retrospective contact tracing on every single person. But I don't think that's the point. The idea is to get a sense of where the transmission is taking place. What sorts of social gatherings? Uh, you know, is it happening in colleges, in universities? Is it happening in churches? We know overall um, there's quite good evidence of, of, of outbreaks at all of those places, but this will give you on a local level where it's tending to happen in, in, in your area. And it doesn't, so you don't need to, to find 100% of the clusters. You just have to get a sense of where they are happening uh, by essentially doing a sampling. And, and then you can take action. Fantastic. Yeah, so I, I, just to underscore those points, retrospective contact tracing helps you both identify cases so that you can do prospective, uh, well, prospective contact tracing and help uh, isolate or stop onward transmission. But maybe more importantly is you sort of learn about the environment in which transmission is happening so that you can uh, modify that environment uh, and so that uh, the transmission doesn't occur there anymore. Um, I So the, um, just to humor, humor you with a little bit of um, an example of this, uh, KJ has, has watched as my family, which is a very strong hockey playing family. I have four daughters, they all play hockey, my husband coaches four hockey teams, and hockey uh, was, you know, it's discovered that it was, um, uh, had led to a couple of clusters, uh, maybe more than a couple in Massachusetts, and uh, much to the heartbreak of my whole family, uh, hockey in Massachusetts was stopped. Youth hockey uh, was stopped. Um, but really what, what was able to happen was they started looking at, well, why was it happening at hockey games? Uh, you know, why were they finding this? And they were able to at least uh, try to modify the practices of the youth hockey teams um, such that uh, such that they could re restart uh, youth hockey, um, and you know, and that's the kind of battle rhythm that we all need to need to get into here. Uh, if we're going to figure out how to um, both drive down uh, the transmission and get a hold of the epidemic, but also um, you know keep living uh, keep living life, um, and so I think there, there's a number of questions around that in the uh, Q and A, um, really about the issues around. Um, um, the, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pick a few. Um, why are uh, universities uh, in Japan and, and schools less, uh, why are you having fewer clusters there than in the United States, do you think? Um, is it something about how you've changed your school, something about the age of the students, uh, or something about um, uh, the nature of the epidemic there? The, thank you for the question. The, the, actually, we are also seeing the, some clusters uh, in the university, but uh, the most of the clusters uh, in university are, have been occurring in dormitory settings and or the outside of the, the lecture, the, the, the drinking party after the lecture uh, and uh, some other the, 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 the activities and the particularly the, the we do not have uh, the many dormitories in Japan and uh, the compared to the, the university in the US. And uh, so the dormitory is uh, the probably uh, the most important, the, the setting the, and uh, 
they they for the sports crowds uh, they they are living in the in a dormitory and uh, we've been seeing the the many the clusters the large clusters in such settings but uh, the usual student are uh, not the many most of the usual students are not staying at the, in the dormitory uh, uh, that may, and also that we are still doing uh, online that or online lectures uh, in the most of the universities and but uh, the probably the dormitory is the most important factor mm -hmm. you. interesting um so so that's interesting in terms of how you sort of think about about clusters, I think that you know another sort of bulk of uh, a cluster of questions in our in our Q and A has to do with uh, really the U.S. context, um, and you know we we've been struggling with testing and having very uh, sort of big limitations in our testing capability, um, and also we are you know seeing this surge in cases. So some questions like um, Dr. Sung, maybe you can. Answer: Does this work in a in a low uh, where you have low testing capability? Uh, and um, you know, what about uh, in in with rising caseloads? Is it kind of worth it? Um, worth the effort? I do think it's worth it. I think that it gives you um, you know with the rising caseloads, you know, you cannot you cannot con contact your trace contact trace yourself out of an epidemic, uh, not a COVID epidemic. Um, but the, the retrospective contact tracing uh, and the pro pro prospective contact tracing is not going to catch every case and catch every cluster. It's not, but I think that for retrospective contact tracing, that's not the goal. The goal is not to, um, is not to find everything. The, the, the goal is to um, understand better um, the, where the transmission is happening and also to guide your efforts. So, so targeted testing, targeted outbreak um, um, response. Um, and, but just going back to the first one, you know, there's another question there about really this rigid um, uh, definition of a close contact. And I think this is really a great example of how it changes, you know, doing retrospective contact tracing changes your or understanding. This is a, it's a really a you know uh, the definition of close contact that's meant to facilitate contact tracing, but it has been so driven into the minds of the community that they think that it's actually protective. And uh, you know we've seen many many you know as you do as you talk to churches as you talk to businesses, uh, we can see. Uh, you know, it's obvious, right? If you have uh, eight, you know, 12, if you have 12% of your workforce in a large warehouse that is infected with COVID, documented infection, um, you know, these, and none of them actually fit the definition of close contact, okay? So what you realize is that in certain situations, in the three Cs, for instance, uh, uh, you know, there is infection that can happen actually quite easily, even for non-close contacts. And no, it's, it's not difficult to figure out that there is an outbreak going on, that all of these are linked. You know, if 12% of your workforce is infected with COVID, is PCR positive and is symptomatic, uh, obviously they are linked in some ways. These are not, these are not independent infections. So this is, you know, even on the, on the, you know, even on the very basic um, uh, understanding of how COVID is tr transmitted within a place that fits the three C's, uh, and for broadening your perspective and 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 giving you uh, the impetus to go a little bit beyond these very very rigid uh, protocols that we're using, I think retrospective contact tracing is is extremely valuable. Fantastic. Well, um, you mentioned sort of uh, the idea of six feet being kind of drilled, you know, just like the mantra now is like this protective warp, invisible warp shield, as long as you're staying six feet away from someone. And we, you know, we just know uh, that that is just not the case uh, in, in uh, tight spaces with, with bad ventilation and you're there for a period of time, you're going to get it, whether you're six feet apart from other people or not. Uh, and uh, Natalie Dean asked a nice question here about how do we communicate uh, the need for retrospective contact tracing uh, with the public? Uh, how do we handle 
some of the sensitivities uh, that might come up. You know, I, I, I know you said people like to talk a lot about where they got infected, uh, which is definitely chimes with my uh, experience with patients as well, they, you know. Um, so for some, that's not going to be an issue. But for others, you know, they're not going to want to reveal, uh, you know, that it was their hairstyling business, uh, you know, or, you know, there's a lot of a lot of difficulties there. So how do we explain this to the public? And how do we address some of the sensitivities uh, around doing this kind of investigation? Well, I, you know, I will say that I think that in the United States, we, uh, we are really behind in this aspect. I think that um, people, you know, I, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll say what I, uh, again, I'll repeat that I don't think the problem is with, with the community. People are quite happy to talk about these things. They are not worried about um, uh, uh, talking about this. They, you know, and like I said, you know, obviously, is there some reluctance sometimes to give up names and phone numbers? Of course. But, you know, in some sense, in, 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 in retrospective contact tracing, that's not even necessary, right? Because you can certainly, you know, if, if somebody says, I went to a Halloween party, if, there, if, there, if, 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 if Halloween parties are, com are coming up again and again and again, 10 days after Halloween, um, you don't have to know exactly who went there. You don't have to know exact uh, guest list of every single one of those parties to know that this is a major, major problem going along, uh, 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 popping up and that in Thanksgiving and in Christmas, it's going to happen again. So I think that, you know, we do have information here that we can gather. We have to be, uh, we have to figure out how to convey that to the public in terms of community education. Um, but, you know, even more broadly, like, I think that because um, we haven't figured out how to, how to explain um, uh, COVID outbreaks to the American public, there is a lot of, of, uh, of both stigma and discrimination, which I think is ridiculous for, for what is relatively, um, you know, which really by now, you know, uh, well into the epidemic should be routine. There should not be any shame. There should not be any discrimination about being about exposing uh, your church or your business uh, while you you know while you were not symptomatic, which which is really the most common situation. And uh, people shouldn't be scared about getting emails saying you've been exposed. You need to go get tested. Uh, out of quote unquote, in abundance of caution. We have not been able to, you know, we haven't done very good communication on this. We have, we have a lot of media that jumps on, um, on clusters and likes to make uh, a huge uh, media event out of it. And that I think perpetuates the problem. But I definitely would like to hear from Professor Oshitani how Japan uh, has dealt with this problem. So thank you. Uh, in Japan, uh, the, we also have some issue uh, regarding the discrimination and so on. And uh, sometimes people do not want to talk. The, the, especially that we have this problem uh, the, with the cluster being the host club or hostess clubs that kind of the nighttime, nightlife in entertainment settings. And the people do not want to talk to where they were. The, and um, the both customers and the, the, the people working in uh, these settings. And um, that was uh, the one of the reason or the, probably the main reason why the, the, these clusters were difficult to control. The, in June, July. And the, we are also seeing that some increasing the of the clusters the, in the, the foreigners community. And um, so, so the communication is uh, quite difficult the, and the people do not usually they go to the clinics for testing. The, so, the, the, we are now trying to find a better way to communicate with them. And, uh, but the, usually the people are the willing to the collaborate the, with the local health authorities, the, particularly with the, the public health nurses. 
but uh, in certain setting, it's more difficult to investigate. All around the world, people are people, um, <laughs> um, and, and and have certain things they like to keep private. Um, Dr. Tefeki, do you want to wrap up with any other uh, any other question, and then we'll um, and then we'll have to continue our conversation uh, in the offline in the in the coming days. I would love for uh, Dr. Oshitani to address the close contact question a little more because I think that's a part of the puzzle that's not very well understood in the United States. We just kind of talked about it, but there was a lot of debate to try to get airborne transmission, you know, aerosol transmission accepted as a method of transmission. And uh, CDC has acknowledged it, but there's some question on like how prominent is this method uh, of transmission and how does this connect with contact tracing? So if you could address how, like what Japan's epidemiologists see as the primary mode of transmission or secondary mode of transmission, if you have any data on how much of which one you're seeing and how that links to how you define close contact, what role ventilation plays and how that links to the kind of cluster busting you do. I think that would be very illuminating for our audience. Thank you very much for the, the question. And uh, we still do not know the exact, the, the proportion of uh, the, the different mode of transmissions, but uh, the, from the beginning, uh, we were considering the, the possibility of uh, the aerosol transmission especially the short distance aerosol transmission. The, because uh, the, from early findings, the, we saw many clusters. The, the, from the, the pre-symptomatic individual. And um, so they did not, of course, the, have any cough or sneezing. But uh, still, the transmission the occurred in the, the, these clusters, and um, so and also the, the we had the many the clusters in cross contact setting, just the the having the the conversation the, between the people the, in these settings, many the transmission the uh, were occurring, and uh, so <clears throat> the. I think uh, the 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 at least the short distance aerosol transmission uh, is probably the the one of the important mode of transmission, but uh, we still do not know how the 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 is a proportion of uh, the such transmission, and uh, but uh, that we are considering. The, to the implement some control measures that we are considering this possibility. And we are using the supercomputer the, to simulate the, the different the, uh, settings and uh, like uh, the theater, the, the, the live music place and uh, so on. And uh, we, the, in this simulation, uh, we are considering the 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 at least uh, the short distance the aerosol transmission, and we also the highly recommend uh, the good ventilation because uh, the the many clusters the most of clusters are occurring in the closed the environment so the ventilation is probably the important and uh, that also suggests that. Uh, the, the, the importance of uh, the aerosol transmission in uh, the these settings. Thank you. Um, 
So fantastic. I, I, you know, I, I, I feel badly we have to wrap up. I feel like we could go on for another couple of hours on, uh, you know, on the issues, everything from how do you set up your, your data, uh, you know, and uh, uh, are there any tools that we can use to help uh, investigators uh, put uh, information together in a way that is uh, more effective or faster, uh, all the way to the, uh, to the issues around building trust with communities um, and thinking about uh, privacy and protections uh, once you're doing this type of, of really deep dives into how people interact with one another. Um, so uh, lots of my, my mind is all of a sudden full of ideas for follow-up seminars, um, but we'll stop here and just a huge uh, thank you uh, to all of the folks that uh, spoke today and uh, to the folks that tuned in.